Welcome to the latest webinar from the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice Economic Justice Committee. My name is Francine Lippman. I'm a William S. Boyd Professor of Law at the William S. Boyd School of Law at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. If you like our work, we'd like to invite you to collaborate with us on projects that you might want to develop and offer to our members and the general public. If you have any ideas, please don't hesitate to send those ideas to me at francine.lipman at unlv.edu. I have had the pleasure and privilege of working with the ABA section of civil rights and social justice, and I can tell you that they make the process, despite technical difficulties, quite seamless. So please uh, join us. Today, we're thrilled to bring you a program uh, entitled Economic, Gender, and Racial Inequality in State and Local Tax Systems. And I can tell you that uh, having the privilege and pleasure of organizing this program, we literally have the dream team of experts from across the country one of whom you can't see because she's experiencing technical difficulties, but believe me, she's online. I'm gonna introduce our panelists in order of their presentation, and each of them is going to present for about 20 minutes, and there will be time for your questions at the end. First, we have Lisa christensen Gee. She is the Director of Special Initiatives at the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. I can tell you without any hesitation, the ITAP, and that's the acronym, website and their publications for me are the go-to resource for state and local tax issues. They survey all 50 states plus Washington, D.C., and have enormous uh, not only policy analysis of all 50 states, but great data that I have used for a book chapter I wrote on state and local tax systems. So we are delighted to have Lisa with us today, and she's gonna give us an overview of state and local tax systems. Unfortunately, when we think about tax policy, quite often we focus on federal tax systems solely. While we know that federal tax systems are generally progressive, state and local tax systems are universally, almost in all states, regressive. So when we talk about the incidence of state system, of tax systems, we really cannot ignore state and local tax systems. So ITEP has given us the data to really think more critically about these systems. After Elisa concludes her overview, talking about racial, gender, and economic inequality, which as many of you know online, we've been facing since the 1970s. So literally for 50 years, we have uh, increasing economic inequality when you talk about economic inequality, you cannot not talk about gender and racial inequality. The intersectionality is ripe. After Lisa gives her comments, we have with us literally the national expert on feminist theory and tax. And even though you can't see her, she is with us in cyberspace. And that is Professor Bridget Crawford She's a professor of law at the Elizabeth Haub Pace Law School in New York. She has literally, with some co-editors, written the book about feminist theory and uh, legal opinions. There's now a series of these books, including a one on tax uh, opinions and feminist theory. So we are very fortunate to have Bridget with us today. Unfortunately, we can't see her when she's going to be presenting on the pink tax, 
uh, talking about a plethora of different taxes that impose a more significant burden on women. And finally, wrapping up this, literally this powerhouse of speakers, we have Professor Kirk Stark, from UCLA, he is the Barrel Family Professor of Tax Law and Policy, and he has been on the front lines of state and local tax systems in California, as well as across the country. He's gonna help us think critically about how the current limit on state tax deductions inherent in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act how that imposes a, a different type of burden on taxpayers, especially when we think about uh, states that have a significant tax uh, burden, including California, as well as New York, and a uh, few other states. To show you how uh, extensive Professor Stark's experience is, this semester at UCLA, his students are fortunate that he is providing an entire seminar on Proposition 13. And so he has been a national resource for thinking critically about state and local tax systems. And we are incredibly fortunate to have him. Then we're gonna open it up to your questions. I'm gonna be able to see your questions online and we're gonna do our best to, to answer them. Uh, I do want you to know that the views expressed herein have not been approved by the ABA House of Delegates or the Board of Governors and accordingly should not be construed as representing the policy of the American Bar Association. Every comment that we make, unless someone says otherwise, is going to be the views of that individual in their personal capacity. During today's program, as I said, you can ask any questions by uh, looking at your webinar control panel and dropping down the question drop down box on the right hand side and typing in your questions. We're going to try to, as I said, we're going to do our best to answer those at the end. Uh, but please feel free to leave us any feedback or ask any questions post this webinar. I can tell you without hesitation, each of these individuals is accessible. They'll find their websites and send them an email. We're all really on the front line of tax justice and want to help you better understand these issues. So without further hesitation, I'm going to pass this off and uh, Lisa Christensen Gee, we are so delighted to welcome you to our webinar. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, as I get my presentation pulled up, we're good. Can you see? Okay. All right. So thank you for having me, Francine, and it's an honor to be here um, as part of this important conversation about inequity and the tax system, particularly the state and local tax system. Um, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based out of Washington, D.C., and we focus on federal as well as state and local tax policy. And we're really geared towards helping lawmakers, the public, advocates, understand the incidence of their various tax policy choices and to hold up questions of equity which frequently are underrepresented in conversations around tax. So today I'm going to talk first of all about the key tax concepts that I'm going to be using to talk about equity and define the terms as I am using them. Speak to what Francine has already previewed which is the regressive nature of most state and local tax systems talk about the ways in which the tax system exacerbates underlying inequalities based on the dimensions of income, race, and ethnicity, and gender. And then also, fortunately, the good news is talk about the ways in which the tax system, which are contributors to some of these problems, and in some cases, the creators of them, um, can help actually reverse these unequitable outcomes and 
promote a broader base of economic support and thriving. So diving in, um, I think it's always helpful in having conversations about tax policy design to acknowledge so that there are a lot of different principles at play that folks may be trying to optimize um, when discussing tax policy. So those can range from making sure you're raising the amount of money needed to fund the public goods that you're looking to support, whether or not that income is continues to keep up with costs over time and with need as it changes, whether it's preventing market distortions that create dead weight loss from an economic perspective. Right, so there's a lot of different principles that are oftentimes um, in competition or tension with one another. And so the, the focus of our conversation today is really on this principle of equity, right? Looking at from the vantage point of different individual taxpayers, how is the tax code impacting them and their ability to spend on the cost of living, to invest in their future, to take economic risks, to build wealth in the future going forward. So the focus of my talk is on this one core principle of equity, which is one of the three core principles that ITEP really promotes and focuses on. There are lots of ways to measure or think about equity, so I want to acknowledge that that is also the case, but highlight that the metric that I'm going to be using today in our conversation is an effective tax rate. So I'm not looking at, you know, if we have two taxpayers, the, the total dollars of taxes that are being paid between them or the share of taxes paid as it relates to the share of income that they hold, or even talking about statutory or marginal tax rates. Um, some of these are, are it's very important information to have and to understand, but when doing a sort of a comparison of taxpayers in dissimilar situations, an effective tax rate gives us sort of an apples to apples metric where we can really compare and understand the relative impact of a law on people of different situations, which is why we use the effective tax rate. Okay, so talking about equity, using the effective tax rate as our measure, uh, two more core concepts, and that is we can look at, think of equity on, on two dimensions. One is horizontally. Um, are taxpayers in similar circumstances paying similar taxes? Are they being treated similarly? Um, so, for example, if you have two taxpayers, each with $100,000 in income, one from earnings, the other from investment or capital gains, and you provide a preferential tax break for capital gains income, even though they have the same income, one is taxpayer two is going to be paying a lower effective tax rate, which would be um, an example of a horizontal inequity. Um, the second kind of equity is vertical equity, which is looking at taxpayers in different situations. So how is the tax affecting taxpayers of different incomes or different abilities to pay? And that's going to be the focus of my remarks today. So there are three core concepts that are important to understand in terminology that we're going to be using, um, starting from the bottom of this chart, move, moving our way up. So if a tax is proportional, um, it means that it takes the same percentage of income from all taxpayers, regardless of how much or how little they earn. So you see this truly, like a true flat tax, right, is one in which the effect of the tax is one where everyone is paying the same effective tax rate. A regressive tax is one in which the lower your income, the higher your tax, and the higher your income, the lower your tax as a share of income. The opposite of that is a progressive tax, where the lower your income, the lower your tax as a share of income, the higher your income, the higher the share of your tax as income. So um, that's how I'm using these terms, regressivity, progressivity, proportional today with a focus on vertical equity. Okay, so with that said, let's dive in. So um, we uh, frequently, every few years, we put out a major study called Who Pays, a distributional analysis of the tax system in all 50 states. And we collect um, actual tax collection data from all 50 states in the District of Columbia, and this includes personal income tax, corporate income tax, property taxes, sales taxes, excise taxes, estate and inheritance taxes, if relevant, anything for which a state-owned resource is levied, for which we have credible collection data and then an economic basis from which we can distribute the, the tax burden across 
individuals of different income types. And we've combined that all together to come up with average effective tax rates for individuals across the income spectrum within each state. And if you review this report, you'll see that there are state-by-state -state tax pages of data that will show you sort of the outcome, and it also breaks out the effective tax rates by tax type. So the primary finding of, of this report, and this continues to be true because there haven't been really major shakeups in the world of state and local tax policy, is that um, overall, most state and local tax systems are regressive, which means the lower one's income, the higher their tax effect rate is, um, as you can see demonstrated here. So these are taking nationwide averages. You'll see that for the lowest quintile, they're paying 11.4% of their incomes in state and local taxes, whereas the top 1% is paying only 7.4%. So this is an illustration of one way in which the, the currently state and local tax systems are creating tax inequities, right? Because the actual tax that is being paid um, is not related to income in the way that maybe um, best relates to our understanding of fairness. Um, another way of thinking about this, if uh, state and local lawmakers were to repeal all of the local and state taxes that they have on their books, and replace them with a single tax on income that looks like this, the, the exact effect that their taxes have right now, um, it's highly unlikely that the majority of citizens would get behind this kind of a tax structure. Yet, in effect, that is what is in place. So right here, this is giving you a display. The states in green are the states that have regressive tax structures. There are about six states um, that are doing a better job at this, where at least in terms of when you compare the effective tax rates of those in the lowest income quintile to those in the highest, you have some progressivity, even if it's not perfectly progressive through the middle. Um, but for the most part, this is a problem in, in almost all states. So a core question is, what is driving this, right? Like, if most lawmakers wouldn't sort of intentionally act, enact this kind of a tax system, like, what, why are we still getting this effect? And the answer to that really comes in understanding the relative regressivity and progressivity of individual tax types, and then seeing the profile of taxes that states have to raise revenue and how much they are relying on each of those various tax types. So for example, states, um, certain taxes like sales and excise taxes are very regressive. Property taxes are somewhat regressive. And income taxes are either proportional or typically progressive. So states that don't have an income tax are going to be more regressive. And states that even that have an income tax but still rely pretty heavily on sales taxes or other more regressive taxes are also going to struggle with regressivity as well. To understand that, um, it's really to understand like how sensitive is a tax to ability to pay. So you, the reason why sales taxes and property taxes are tend to be more regressive is that the tax base, right, what you're applying the rate to is based on the price of the good or consumption, you know, the amount of a good purchased um, or the value of a home, right, which are oftentimes related to income but not perfect correlates with it. And as a result, you're going to get the outcomes when you're looking at how that tax impacts someone with $50,000 of income versus $100,000 versus $20,000 in income. So for example, if our two taxpayers, um, one with $100,000, one with $50,000, are purchasing the same $250 appliance and there's a 10% sales tax, they will each be paying $25 in taxes. And that $25 represents twice the size of income from our second taxpayer as it does our first income. Um, there's also, because of differences in consumption and the fact that folks with higher income can, they can afford to save um, money, that, and that money that is not spent is not subject to tax. Um, these are drivers into the regressivity of sales and excise taxes. Going back to income taxes, so income taxes sort of by definition um, are adjust based on what income is, right? Because the income, the, the tax base is income itself. So even if you were to have just a flat tax, a flat income tax rate, 
um, for our first taxpayer with $100,000, if you have a 5% income tax, um, you know, and, and this is taxable income, you know, they're going to be paying $5,000 versus $2,500 from our taxpayer with $50,000. So it's built into an income tax that the amount due is going to vary by income, which allows for progressivity if you are varying rates or you're varying the amount of income that is subject to tax and you can create disproportionate effects for individuals at disparate income with an income tax in a way that is much harder to do and not practical to do in sales with sales taxes or other tax types um, apart from broader measures such as completely exempting certain types of goods from taxation. So if you look here, um, this is a census data showing the makeup of states' own sources by different tax types. So states get about 30% of their revenues from federal funds. Um, some of them get the majority of them, just a few states get the majority of their funding from federal funds. And you'll see here that we have a lot of, of different outcomes. So for example, Florida, they don't have a personal income tax. And so 63% of their revenues is coming from general sales taxes, which we know are more regressive in nature, which means overall, the combined impact of all of their taxes are going to be largely regressive. Um, and in comparison, look at California, which has a personal income tax, and it relies very heavily on that income tax to raise over half of its total state-owned sources. And as a result, it's also able to rely less on more regressive sales taxes, and that's also going to impact how it performs overall in the regressivity or progressivity of its tax system. Um, so, so this is not a surprise then when you see that the what we dub the terrible 10 are those states that show up as having the most regressive tax systems have certain characteristics in common. These are states that don't levy income taxes. Seven of, seven of the 10 don't levy income taxes. Those that do rely on a flat income tax rate or a nearly flat income tax. Um, and they all rely very heavily on consumption taxes. Um, I'm going to skip through these slides, but this just gives you some additional data that demonstrates the way in which reliance on sales taxes and not including a personal income tax or a very graduated income tax into the mix contributes to tax inequities across the income spectrum. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the good news is that some states are doing better than others, and we're going to talk about, I'll point you to some resources that show kind of what characteristics they have in common. But as you could expect, it's just the flip side of what makes tax codes regressive, right? A higher reliance on personal income tax, limiting deductions or exemptions on those with higher incomes, having a range of tax brackets and rates, using refundable tax credits that can help um, offset the uh, regressivity of sales taxes and levying um, taxes on wealth, such as the state or inheritance taxes. So we see that regressive tax systems create new kinds of inequities, right? Tax inequities. Um, and it's also the case that they exacerbate inequalities that already exist. And one dimension in which they do that is of, with income. So as Francine mentioned, we know that over like the course, if you look at data from the past several decades, um, that, you know, income is, is very um, unequally distributed across, you know, the different income quintiles, and that growth, income growth, uh, the gains that have been um, occurring uh, since, you know, the, the 1980s or so have disproportionately gone to a very small concentration of individuals. So um, what does the tax code or how do state and local taxes have anything to do with that? Well, um, to help sort of comment on that or to see the effect, ITEP uses something called the ITEP Inequality Index, which is um, the way that we try to measure whether uh, state and what, whether incomes are more or less equal after state and local taxes are levied. So I have an example here um, just to try to demonstrate or illustrate this concept. So again, we have our two taxpayers. And if you see before state taxes are levied, the ratio of income from the higher income taxpayer to the lower income taxpayer is two to one, right? So taxpayer one has twice the amount of income as taxpayer two. And if we apply the effect, the, av the national average effective tax rates for individuals, now, you know, obviously my example is not perfect here because $50,000 is in, in the first income spectrum. But if you apply disparate effective tax rates to these two individuals, 
this is the tax amount. And then post after taxes, you know, they, they both have income that is, you know, less than what they had before because they paid taxes. And now the ratio, I don't know if you can see this because my control panel might be in the way, excuse me. Um, but the ratio of their incomes is now all of a sudden um, a lot higher. So now, even though they both have less income than they had before, the amount of income that taxpayer one has compared to taxpayer two is not just two times that, it's two point almost, you know, 2.1 times that. So you can see how um, the uh, disparate and in, in unfair uh, regressive effective tax rates contributes to and agitates sort of underlying income inequality. If you're interested in learning more about this, um, inequality index is sort of a bit of a complicated concept, but we go into it more in the appendix of our Who Pays report, so I'll draw your attention to that. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that if they come up. Um, additionally, um, we know that there are, are deep inequalities based on race and ethnicity and gender. Um, and, you know, as the result of, you know, the foundations of our country and historical as well as current barriers to earnings and savings that has led to stark gaps in wealth and income. Um, here's just a couple of stats. We know that the, the median wealth among black families is 10 times less than the median wealth among white families. And that we see sort of similar gaps in, in earnings between black families and white families, as well as Hispanic families and white families. And we know that regressive state and local tax systems exacerbate these inequalities, right? By taxing lower income people who, and we know that um, people of color are overrepresented in lower income quintiles and underrepresented in higher income quintiles. So regressive tax rates also exacerbate racial inequities. And furthermore, if you have tax breaks or subsidies that benefit the wealthiest, you're similarly, um, exacerbating inequalities by re rewarding uh, the income and wealth of individuals who are, are predominantly um, white. Um, so in particular, certain of these policies that are at issue include um, any tax breaks that are geared to just homeowners and don't account for renters, such as the mortgage interest deduction, property tax deduction, homestead exemptions, homeowner only circuit breakers, and tax breaks specifically that are targeted for wealth. So capital gains exemptions, estate and inheritance tax repeals, et cetera. All of these are going to exacerbate uh, these inequalities that already exist along racial and ethnic lines. So right now we don't currently have um, average effective tax rate calculations by race and ethnicity, but I am happy to um, let you know that we have a report forthcoming in early 2020 that will be a companion piece to our Who Pays report that will break down um, the impact of state and local taxes by race and ethnicity um, so that we can be able to more clearly articulate the implications of existing tax structures and proposed policy changes as well as advocate better for more inclusive tax policies. And I'll let you read these on the slides by yourself. And then in terms of gender inequities, so this is another area where we are building out our capacity to be able to model um, gender into our analyses. And we ideally would want to be able to identify not only like the number of women taxpayers impacted by the current tax system and various proposals, but also to be able to, to describe the magnitude of those effects so that we can see clearly how the existing tax system and any proposed changes are either showing up or undermining the economic power of, of women, particularly um, women of color. Um, we have um, a wonderful uh, thing today that the National Women's Law Center in partnership with several organizations has just released three new reports on gender and the tax code. So I invite you to, if you have not already encountered those, to look those up and to add them to your nightly reading stand. Um, where now the focus of, of their work is really on state tax or federal tax codes, but it has implications for state tax codes and so many states conform to the federal tax code or mirror certain exemptions or credits on the federal uh, equivalent. Um, so some of the key findings there include, uh, similarly to, to race and ethnicity, the finding that families of color and women supporting families on their own are overrepresented in lower income quintiles, underrepresented in higher income quintiles. And this is due to persistent wage disparities that are driven by policies, right? Unequal pay, disproportionate caregiving responsibilities, gender discrimination, 
And we know on the flip side that many of the tax breaks that have been designed are, are going to mostly higher income, mostly white um, households. And one of the wonderful things about the National Women's Law Center report is that they're really pointing out a lot of the ways in which the assumptions and the worldview and the values baked into our tax codes really are non-inclusive, they're not reflective of the majority of Americans, the way they live their life, the formation of their families, how income is earned, um, how labor is divided. Um, so I invite you to, to pull up those reports and, and to give them a look. In closing, I just want to point you to a couple of resources. Um, what, while the tax code is the source of, of these inequities, excuse me, of, of tax inequity, right, it's also the solution. Meaning, um, because we, ha we have states who are doing this better than others, there are ways that state lawmakers can make changes and that advocates can push for changes that lead to more equitable outcomes, both in terms of economic outcomes and as a result also racial um, ethnic and gender outcomes. So I invite you to look up our report, Moving Towards More Equitable State and Local Tax Systems. We also have a report specifically on how state tax codes could be used to fight poverty, identifying the four critical you know, policies that really help make that difference. All right, I turn my time back over. Thank you, Lisa. As everyone can see, this is a complicated topic, and, but the good news is there are lots of brilliant scholars like Lisa working on the front lines to try to mitigate this issue and start to move us in the right direction. I encourage each of you to take a look at ITEP's website. It's itep.org. Uh, as well as the National Women's Law Center. I was uh, fortunate to work with the team on that report. They have a repository of fabulous information. So now we are going to turn uh, the table over to Professor Bridget Crawford. And we're not going to be able to see her, but as you can see, she's gonna talk about the very pink tax Thank you, Bridget, for joining us. I thank you, Professor Lippman, and thanks to the ABA uh, Civil Rights and Social uh, Justice Section for facilitating this conversation about how the tax system is deeply intertwined with some of the important issues of rights and justice in our time. I'd like to focus uh, for now on what is commonly called the pink tax. That's uh, an umbrella term for a whole bunch of taxes. And when uh, people are talking about tax in this context, they mean it both uh, literally and metaphorically. Um, a, a tax on uh, things that women use or tax, taxes associated with women. And I should say at the outset by women, I mean all female forms, uh, trans women, cis women, femme presenting people. With that framework, uh, consider a simple example that you might find at your local drugstore. Uh, in 2015, a New York City study found uh, several examples, several examples of uh, situations where the price of comparable uh, products varied based on whether it was a so-called man's product or a woman's uh, product. Uh, the uh, report produced in New York City, uh, I just put the title of it there on the screen, From the Cradle to the Pain, the Cost of Being a Female Consumer. So one of the uh, most engaging aspects of this study was finding that something very simple like hair conditioner uh, cost more when it had pink on the label or was targeted toward women whereas the men's product uh, had a lower sticker price. Uh, so body wash is one example, scooters is, is another one, the very same scooter uh, produced by Radio Flyer, $24.99 uh, if red or $49.99 uh, in uh, pink. There is absolutely no federal rule preventing different pricing along these lines. There is no federal prohibition against gender differential pricing. On the state level, 
California most notably has legislation that provides that no business establishment of any kind whatsoever may discriminate with respect to the price for services or of, of similar or like kind against a person because of gender. Not enough states have followed California's example. We know that women pay an upcharge for certain services. That may be borne out in the case of haircuts, for example, Alexandra uh, Ocasio-Cortez's haircut and the charge for it recently made news. Um, and in some cases, haircuts for women might be more complicated or take time uh, more than would be needed to do a simple men's cut, but that's not always the case. And of course, a pleated silk blouse might take more time and product to dry clean than say a simple men's shirt. But what about uh, situations involving a simple button down shirt? What if a laundry service or a dry cleaner charges different prices for servicing the man's shirt on the left or the woman's shirt on the right? That's hard to get our heads around. That is what I uh, and many others call the pink tax. There is a fantastic website for anyone who's interested called Fox the Pink Tax. Um, I have the URL right up there on the screen, lower left hand side. According to the folks behind this website, a 50 year old woman will have already spent during her lifetime uh, $68,319 more than a man would. Now, this is an incredibly blunt instrument. It's mostly for entertainment, it's not accurate for uh, lawyers, accountants, etc. It doesn't take into account geographical differences. It, it serves a larger point though. The larger point is this, it's expensive to be female. But there is another major arena in which households containing women and girls are economically disadvantaged by an actual sales tax. And that is uh, the sales tax imposed on uh, menstrual hygiene products, typically tampons and pads. 33 states in the U.S. have uh, a tax on uh, tampons and pads. Or to back up for a minute, let me give you a quick description of what the sales tax is. So every state in the U.S. can decide for itself whether it wants to have a sales tax or not. We heard that earlier from Lisa. 45 states in the U.S have a sales tax. For the states that do have a sales tax, generally speaking, sales of things, tangible property, are subject to state sales tax unless they are marked for exemption. Typical exemptions that many states have will be for medicine, medical devices, food, and in some jurisdictions, clothing. We might think for convenience as these exemptions exemptions largely for the necessities of life, but of course um, that is not always uh, the case. Uh, enter into the conversation, uh, tampons, pads, menstrual cups, and other products that approximately half the population uses once a month for many years of their lives. In 33 states, uh, these products are subject to state sales tax. And I'll refer to that as the tampon tax. The rate of sales tax, depending on the jurisdiction, can be all over the place. In higher states like New Jersey, 6.625%, uh, Minnesota, 6.875%, and then on the lower end, Alabama, Georgia, South Dakota at 4% have a state sales tax at this rate. Local counties or cities may impose a tax on top of that. So of the 33 states that have a sales tax on tampons and pads, the results are not predictable based on any sort of conventionally understood red state, blue state di dichotomy, or even on geography. You'll see that from uh, the map on the screen. Seven states have changed their laws in 2016, 17, 18 or later the most recent addition, Ohio, uh, uh, joined that group when the governor signed legislation just earlier this month repealing the sales tax on menstrual hygiene products. 
The tampon tax began to take on greater salience or at least seeped into public consciousness with an online petition co-sponsored by none other than Cosmopolitan Magazine, urging state legislatures to stop taxing our periods, period. That petition was based on a similar petition begun in the US, or pardon me, in the UK, in the UK, and has since been adapted in many other countries. In 2016, a class action lawsuit was filed uh, challenging New York State's tampon tax. New York already had under legislative consideration repeal of the tampon tax, but filing of the lawsuit sure as heck didn't hurt. The same thing happened in Florida. That state's legislature repealed the tax after a class action litigation was filed there. And finally, Ohio, uh, a place of third class action litigation, um, as I said, repealed its tax earlier this month. But inequality persists in the 33 states with the tampon tax, and that leads to, to some absurd uh, results, absolutely absurd results. Courtesy of the nation's first nonprofit uh, law and policy organization fighting uh, on this issue, period equity. They've partnered with uh, a menstrual hygiene product manufacturer, Lola, for a campaign they're calling tax-free period. And I've borrowed from um, that uh, campaign three simple examples, uh, very social media friendly, private jet parts aren't taxed in Colorado, uh, but menstrual hygiene products are. Pudding mix, not taxed in Maine. Golf club memberships, not taxed in Rhode Island. Period Equity, I'll give you their website for anyone who's interested. Period Equity has announced its intention to file lawsuits in each of the 33 states that still has a sales tax on uh, tampons. And the basis for that lawsuit is a law review article I've written with my colleague, uh, Emily Gold Waldman, called the Unconstitutional Tax Tampon Tax which argues exactly that. Uh, just highlighted the important text there. Our argument is that menstrual hygiene products are so closely tied to the female uh, body, their unfavorable tax treatment is in effect a tax on women. And so we think we've got a facial classification. Even if we don't have a facial uh, classification, uh, we think it is a sex-based classification triggering intermediate scrutiny, which it cannot pass because there's no exceedingly persuasive justification for excluding menstrual hygiene products from various exemptions afforded to other uh, necessities like Band-Aids um, and the like. It will be very interesting to see what happens with those lawsuits, and I expect that we're gonna hear more about those soon. There are so many more examples of pink tax, but I want to just mention two more in my remaining time. The first is a pink tax on transportation. In November of 2018, a year ago, a group of uh, scholars associated with NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service found that women who can afford to change their mode of transportation at a cost, an extra cost of $26 to $50 a month for safety reasons. So at least in New York, women who otherwise would take the subway instead are choosing to take taxis or ride sharing services, especially when traveling at night if they can afford it. Practically speaking, what does that mean? Well, it means that women who work at night, nurses, bartenders, fast food workers, office cleaners, suffer a financial disadvantage that their similarly situated male counterparts do not. And vis-a-vis -vis women who work during the day, the nighttime workers are paying a penalty for their schedules. So these are women who are already in economically precarious positions quite often, and they are playing extra to try to hang on to their physical security and the economic precarity that they have achieved. And then finally, to continue uh, the discussion and then hopefully wrap up the discussion of the pink tax, we have to mention the persistent wage gap. 
an organization called Payscale has used data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics to demonstrate that women in the United States still make 79 cents for every dollar that men do. That's taking the median ratio of all women's earnings to the median ratio of all men's earnings across all sectors, 79 cents on the dollar. If you control for years of experience, industry, geographic location, job title, so that all you are comparing is gender, that gap sh shrinks, it does, to 98 cents on the dollar. But that difference in what economists call the controlled gender gap, comparing apples to apples, the difference remains, it is economically significant and it has been largely unchanged for four years. The largest uncontrolled pay gap is experienced by American Indian uh, women, Black and Hispanic women, to use the classification language used in the original survey. For many years, feminists and other thought leaders have sought to remedy the situation of women's unequal pay by creating paid parental leave, a leave policy written in a gender neutral way with the hope also that men would be incentivized to engage in more childcare providing and also separately that women who took time to engage in caregiving would be able to rejoin the workforce without financial penalties. The New York Times reported earlier this week uh, under the headline, a surprising finding on paid leave. This is not the way we teach uh, this. Uh, these are the results of a study of California workers. California had been the first state to offer paid family leave beginning in 2004. Researchers found that women who took paid leave, in fact, uh, ended up both earning less and working less 10 years later. So it did not have the impact uh, that people had hoped, keeping women in the workforce longer and uh, remedying pay inequity. So the preliminary indication from this study is that paid leave isn't a panacea, is not a panacea. And by the way, it's not changing male behavior either. Men represented 15, 1.5% of all claimants of California paid medical leave, but the average man uh, took just two or three days of paid leave, two or three days. So the challenges remain both in the workforce and at home because the balance of caretaking, it, it would seem, uh, has not changed. There is so much more to say about pink taxes and the way tax is a very important lens for evaluating gender inequality for women and men of all colors. I don't wanna to intrude too much onto my co-panelist time, so I'll stop there and look forward to more discussion in the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Crawford. As you can see, this is a rich topic. And if, if we think about wealth and income inequality and the exacerbation of these uh, economic situations over the last 50 years, we think about how this impacts women uh, women in, of color and poor women. Uh, as Professor Crawford has indicated, it costs more to be a woman. And when we add to that uh, cost, uh, a recent report that just came out by the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia, they just uh, documented in evidence how the inflation factor for low-income individuals is much higher than higher-income individuals. So the regressivity of taxes, including pink taxes, is exacerbated for these populations. And this is one reason we're in the situation that we're in. So we need scholars like Professor Crawford, and ITAP and Lisa Gee Christensen to help us think about, think critically about what we can do on a going forward basis. So I encourage you to follow Professor Crawford. 
She is uh, one of the uh, lead bloggers on feministlawprofessors.com. That's a blog. And she's also, uh, like most of us now, on Twitter. And her handle is at Prof B. Crawford. In any case, thank you. And we'll continue the conversation uh, about these issues in the Q&A. But we want to give our co-panelist, Kirk Stark, some time. He's at UCLA. Uh, for those of you on the East Coast, he was bragging about the warm sunshine. I'm feeling it here in Nevada. But now we're going to let him uh, take control of the uh, webinar and talk tax. Thank you, Professor Stark, for being with us. Thank you so much, uh, Francine. Let me see if I can uh, get my uh, screen to, is um, that's all good now? Great. So um, yeah, this is, first of all, I wanna, I wanna thank uh, Francine for uh, including me and then also thank both uh, Lisa and Bridget for their uh, terrific presentations. I felt like I, I learned a great deal. Um, I'm gonna, uh, take a little time and uh, give a sort of slightly uh, different uh, focus here and, and make... Before you do that, uh, Professor yeah. Stark, I'm going to interrupt because we are not seeing the full screen. We're seeing uh, your view. Gotcha. So we'll switch that. Now we see your face. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. I'll jump. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, so the, 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 the points that I'm going to make here will ultimately tie back into, as Francine mentioned at the uh, beginning, uh, tie back into the uh, federal tax policy question of what role, if any, the federal government should play in uh, subsidizing state and local tax payments. Uh, as I'm sure most people know, there's been a, a deduction on the books since the beginning of the federal income tax for uh, state and local tax payments, uh, and that was recently as part of the 2017 legislation enacted in Congress, uh, very substantially curtailed with the new uh, state and local tax cap or SALT cap, uh, section 164B6. So um, I'm going to sort of try to take some of the uh, issues relating to progressivity and redistribution and tie them into this um, uh, question of um, what kind of federal subsidy, if, if any, there should be for uh, state and local tax uh, payments. So I, I want to um, start, I guess, with uh, what I think is um, a sort of a recap of uh, some of the concepts that Lisa introduced uh, earlier, just sort of thinking about what we mean by progressivity. Uh, and then I want to take the concept of progressivity and, and um, uh, sort of blow it up a, a little bit uh, broader into a, a, the concept of redistribution and emphasize the, the difference between those two things. Uh, progressivity, of course, is, uh, as Lisa uh, correctly noted, was, um, uh, you know, when we look at the uh, fraction of a, uh, an individual or family's tax liability as, as, a, as a share of their uh, income, if it rises with income, then a system tax system is regarded as progressive. If it declines, as we saw in the data that she presented, uh, then it's regressive. Um, uh, and I guess the, the main thing that I want to do is, is sort of emphasize uh, a subsidiary point, uh, which is that uh, focusing on the progressivity or regressivity of the tax system in isolation uh, may not really capture what it is that we really care about. Um, uh, and the notion here is that uh, moving to a broader concept of redistribution may uh, sort of better capture uh, those concerns. Uh, assuming that what we really care about is uh, mitigating resource inequality, um, uh, then uh, I guess my contention here is going to be that um, it, we'd be uh, sort of better served by thinking about redistribution in a broad sense rather than uh, progressivity of the tax system. Um, progressivity, of course, average tax rates rising with the income, um, and the question being how do you tax burdens vary by income levels. Uh, redistribution sort of adds two additional questions beyond that. Uh, what is the distribution of public spending, uh, and what is the uh, aggregate tax burden? What is the overall uh, average tax rate? So I'm going to start with um, uh, 
uh, some uh, figures from the ITEP report, and uh, I guess I want to sort of um, uh, uh, begin my comments here by as associating myself with the, the, the views expressed earlier by Francine about uh, what a, a phenomenal resource uh, this is. I, every year when the uh, the new ITEP report comes out. Uh, I am a very eager consumer uh, of the report. And it's a it's absolutely terrific uh, resource for very detailed data about the distributional uh, effects of state and local tax systems. Um, so what you can see here is basically just a reproduction of the same uh, graph that Lisa uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, once again, you can see that. Uh, average tax rates are highest for the for the bottom 20% at 11.4%, uh, um, and uh, for the top 1%, we see is the same as in uh, the um, uh, figure that she showed earlier. The uh, average tax rate is 7.4%. Uh, what I've done here is sort of layer in the average income levels from the the data on the ITEP website, so we can get a sort of a better sense of how those average tax rates translate into uh, average taxes paid. Uh, and so you can see that on the far right-hand column where uh, the 11.4% uh, average tax rate for average income of 12,500 uh, suggests an average tax paid of, of 1,425. Of course, uh, the percentages go down with income, the average tax paid goes up with income uh, to the extreme, you can see in the top 1%, 7.4% uh, uh, average tax rate, which is the, the lowest across the income distribution, uh, produces an average tax paid of uh, 122,000. Uh, so this is, uh, in particular, significant when we think about decomposing the uh, top uh, quintile there into the uh, 15, 4% uh, and 1%, the way the ITEP uh, report uh, usefully does. Um, you can get a, a better picture of uh, the um, uh, average tax paid uh, of the individuals who up until 2017 uh, had enjoyed the benefit of the deduction for state and local taxes in, in federal law. Um, bottom line here before I move on to the next uh, screen uh, is that the average tax paid for uh, the population as a whole uh, comes out to uh, a rate of 8.845% uh, and an average tax paid of 7,522. So um, now kind of a little bit more uh, detail on this point about uh, shifting from a focus on progressivity to a focus on uh, redistribution. Uh, I want to focus specifically on two questions. What is the distribution of spending uh, across income levels? This is um, actually a, a sort of remarkably difficult uh, question to answer, uh, as we'll see, but we can sort of um, make some uh, assumptions and then uh, think about how those different assumptions would affect overall redistribution. Uh, and then question two, what is the overall level uh, of uh, tax uh, collections? Keeping in mind here these points at the bottom, um, uh, progressivity, of course, does not equal uh, redistributions. The tax systems can have comparable levels of progressivity or regressivity and have different levels of redistribution. Uh, and then also, you know, you can have a very redistributive uh, uh, fiscal system that is uh, underwritten by a regressive tax system uh, or vice versa. You can have a progressive tax system that uh, provides very little redistribution. So um, uh, moving on then, uh, if we were to uh, look at a hypothetical distribution of spending uh, that is based on an equal amount of uh, spending being uh, transferred to each of the uh, five quintiles. Basically, all I've done there is put that in the column uh, under hypothetical distribution of spending, the 7,522 figure that we saw in the previous slide. Um, then we can compare that amount to the average tax paid and get a sense in the far right-hand column of what the overall net distribution is for each uh, quintile based on the relationship be between those two prior figures. Um, so uh, the point here uh, is that, uh, let's take the bottom uh, quintile, for example. Um, uh, this is a regressive, this is the country as a whole, uh, all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, 
um, aggregated into um, one set of data. Uh, but you can see that uh, even with this regressive tax system, uh, the bottom quintile, if we assume this particular hypothetical distribution of spending, is still a net beneficiary of uh, redistribution to the tune of roughly uh, $6,000. Uh, meanwhile, the top quintile, um, uh, while it's paying the lowest uh, uh, rate of, uh, I think it was 8.2% for the top 20%, um, has a $13,600 uh, net redistribution loss. Uh, the point here, of course, just being that whether or not a, um, a tax system uh, uh, is redistributive is a function not only of the distribution of the tax burden, but also the distribution uh, of the spending. So what do we know uh, about the distribution of spending? Um, well, one way uh, to get at that question is to ask what it is that state and local governments spend money on. Uh, I don't think any of this will come as a surprise to anybody participating in this uh, uh, webinar um, that uh, the vast majority of um, uh, state and local government spending goes to these top two categories, public welfare and elementary and secondary uh, education. Public welfare here, these are figures from uh, the Urban Institute Tax Policy Center. Um, public welfare here defined uh, as uh, Medicaid, uh, temporary assistance for needy families, general welfare uh, assistance, things uh, of that nature, uh, elementary and secondary education, of course, K through 12 education. And then you can see these additional uh, categories that kind of give us a sense. It doesn't give us a specific number by uh, quintile, but you can uh, start to get a sense of what the distribution uh, or the distributional incidence of uh, state and local government spending is based on the types of programs that state and local governments uh, are funding. Um, obviously, these things vary quite significantly by state. Uh, here again, uh, figures from the Tax Policy Center that, that give us a little bit of a sense of which states spend the most on Medicaid, TANF, general welfare assistance, uh, noted in the, the left-hand uh, side by the darker colors. So California, Oregon, Washington, DC, uh, Massachusetts, New York, uh, all the kind of usual suspects um, in terms of uh, which states you think are likely to spend the most on uh, those items. As for uh, education, uh, again, on the right, you can sort of see um, some of this, there's some overlap like New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, uh, uh, California, uh, sadly, uh, kind of on not, not quite on the higher end of uh, state and local elementary and secondary uh, um, education expenditures. Um, so the basic observation here then is that uh, we, um, uh, if what we're concerned about is mitigating resource inequality for uh, low and, and uh, middle income households, uh, we should be thinking not only about the tax system, but also about how we're spending that money. Uh, and that reliance on a regressive tax system doesn't necessarily preclude uh, inequality, reducing redistribution of resources. Uh, of course, it also depends on the overall level uh, of uh, state and local uh, revenue. And so here we can see uh, how that has increased uh, over time, if you're looking in, in real terms from 1977 to 2016, uh, overall state and local general revenue uh, has nearly tripled. Uh, so uh, all of these increases to the extent that um, uh, the uh, distribution of uh, state and local spending uh, uh, is uh, progressive as compared to the tax system, uh, as the tax system grows in significance, as the uh, state and local public sector grows in significance, uh, then the um, uh, beneficial effects of a progressive um, distribution of spending uh, will likewise increase uh, over time. So we can see that if we, if we go back to this notion of thinking about um, uh, how a distribution of spending uh, helps to counteract um, the regressive effects of the tax system. Uh, this is just a sort of reproduction of the same slide that I showed uh, earlier, suggesting um, the net distribution, redistrib 
excuse me, net redistribution gains and losses uh, if we assume a um, uh, yeah, equal distribution of spending across uh, income levels. Um, now what I'm going to do is sort of go to the, uh, um, uh, assume that let's say we um, maintained the exact same level of regressivity in the tax system, uh, but increased taxes by 50%. Uh, what effect would that have uh, on net redistribution? Uh, and of course the answer is, uh, by increasing taxes by 50% across the board, again, same level of regressivity, but the amount of redistribution that is taking place uh, is likewise 50% greater. So the those who gain uh, via redistribution gain 50% more than they did uh, prior to the increase in taxes, uh, and those who lose uh, under uh, the uh, final column there, lose uh, again to the uh, a, an increase of, of 50%. Um, so again, the point here is um, uh, not only that does it matter what, what the distribution of spending is, but what is the overall level of spending, which of course is a function uh, in part of average tax rates. So to have a very progressive tax system that raises very little revenue uh, doesn't do anybody any good on a on a uh, redistribution dimension. Um, uh, so uh, the point here is is that uh, size matters. That uh, you know the uh, um, overall uh, role of state and local government um, uh, significantly affects the amount of redistribution. Again, depending upon the distribution of spending. Um, so what is the distribution of spending across? Uh, states. Here we can take a look at um, figures from the uh, uh, Census of Governments report from the th from the uh, Census Bureau, um, and all I'm showing here are the top five and the bottom five in terms of per capita tax collections. This is um, compiled by the Federation of Tax Administrators, but based on data from the Census, you can see that the the differences are very significant uh, across states. Uh, as high as $10,717 per capita in the District of Columbia, and a low of uh, 3370 uh, in uh, Alabama. Um, the, uh, so again, uh, higher average tax rates, generally more distributive, uh, regardless of the progressivity or regressivity of, of the uh, tax system. So what does that mean for um, uh, this uh, point about um, uh, deduction for state and local taxes and the potential role, if any, for the federal government. Um, what I've done here in this uh, chart is to basically try to capture uh, four different categories of states. Um, and uh, what you see there in the different quadrants um, uh, in the, in the uh, parentheticals there, uh, in the parentheses on each side of the state, on the left-hand side uh, is the state's ITEP ranking. Uh, and um, a higher, you know, the, the, um, the number one, for example, means, you know, Washington, Pennsylvania, Illinois, those are all in the, um, um, I think Lisa called it the, you know, the terrible 10. Um, so those are states that have very regressive tax systems, but they're also states that have relatively high spending. So they're in the upper left-hand uh, quadrant there. Um, California, Minnesota, New York, those states um, are uh, uh, in the uh, category um, uh, uh, among the six uh, that Lisa mentioned that have uh, the most progressive, or however you want to phrase it, least regressive uh, um, state and local tax systems, 51, 47, 44. They're also very high spending states. Um, on the bottom, then, what you can see are regressive taxes with low spending, uh, Arizona, Florida, Texas being uh, good examples, uh, and then progressive taxes uh, with low spending, Idaho, South Carolina, West Virginia. Uh, how does this relate to the deduction for state and local taxes in federal law? Uh, basically, the, that deduction, which is available uh, or was available only for itemizers, uh, and the value of it is a, is a function of the um, federal taxpayer's marginal tax rate, federal marginal tax rate, uh, meaning that it's a very 
regressive subsidy viewed at the federal level. Um, uh, what that does is it encourages states to adopt more progressive tax systems or less regressive tax system. It favors those states in the upper right-hand quadrant uh, that have high spending uh, and more progressive tax systems. So California and New York would be the uh, uh, two clearest beneficiaries of the uh, Section 164 deduction uh, for state and local taxes. Uh, now that we have the cap of $10,000 uh, on uh, the deductibility of state and local taxes, um, we are disfavoring that um, upper right-hand quadrant. Uh, and a predictable consequence over time uh, of this particular change in federal law is that we should expect states to shift more uh, to the uh, lower left-hand uh, quadrant, the Arizona, Florida, Texas quadrant, uh, to have more regressive tax systems and lower spending because we no longer have this feature of federal law that promotes both larger state and local um, uh, um, government spending and more progressive state and local uh, uh, tax systems. Um, this might be the right policy decision but it's you know it's the the point here is um that you know we should be we should be clear about what the potential of effects uh are of of having this so this is this is my last slide i i um I'm apologize i haven't really been paying attention to how much time i've been taking up but um uh basically over the next few years um we are going to face a question this this new limitation on the deductibility of state and local taxes it's scheduled to expire uh, at the end of 2025. Uh, and so Congress is going to have to address this. Um, should it be um, uh, discontinued entirely? Should there be any subsidy at all uh, for investments in the state and local public uh, sector? Uh, if there is, then we have some um, uh, uh, options that we need to consider. One is to reinstate uh, pre-2018 uh, law um, completely. So reinstate a full uh, SALT deduction. Uh, and that entails a trade-off. That, that is a, a highly regressive federal subsidy that, that very dramatically favors uh, wealthier taxpayers uh, in the top uh, 1%, those who are the uh, sort of net contributors to um, subnational redistribution. Um, but uh, that federally regressive subsidy promotes, pro, you know, promotes a larger state and local public sector uh, and also promotes more progressive state and local tax uh, systems. Um, so if we want to have a federal subsidy that has those uh, characteristics of promoting progressive uh, state and local tax systems, uh, it's likely to be something that's a federally regressive uh, subsidy. One alternative that I've uh, written about previously was, would be um, to have a flat rate credit rather than a deduction, have, for example, a 15% credit uh, for state and local tax payments uh, that is not dependent on whether or not the taxpayer uh, itemizes. And by making it a credit rather than a deduction, uh, you can unhitch the value of the subsidy from the taxpayer's federal marginal tax rate. Uh, and the same 15% subsidy would be available for everybody. Uh, you, this credit could presumably even be made uh, refundable if we wanted uh, to do it that way. Um, that would be less regressive at the federal level, uh, but it would also um, uh, promote more regressive state and local tax systems. Um, yet another option that, um, uh, that and a paper that I'm, I'm currently working on relates to this question of uh, taxing groceries. Uh, so if you think about uh, um, the taxation of groceries um, uh, uh, in isolation, I think it, it, it looks like uh, a sort of terrible regressive uh, policy. On the other hand, uh, one could imagine a federal subsidy that uh, essentially compensates uh, low-income households for the cost of state and local uh, uh, food taxes, grocery taxes. Um, the idea there being uh, that um, those individuals should be made whole for having experienced that cost and the federal subsidy would have the effect of, of promoting a, a more redistributive state and local tax structure. Um, 
these are uh, obviously some, uh, you know, very preliminary thoughts offered here at the at the end of this uh, presentation. But uh, the hope is by um, sort of uh, pinpointing some of these things and pointing in, in some directions, we can sort of start to think about uh, what federal law should look like uh, on the horizon as as the uh, salt cap is scheduled to expire in 2025. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stark and all of the panelists. We have a lot of food for thought now and a couple questions that have come in. Uh, one for a uh, couple questions for Professor Stark. Uh, so as long as your uh, brain is warmed up, we'll ask you to continue the conversation. And that is uh, Professor Merkay, who's also uh, listening from Hawaii. I'm sure it's gorgeous there. He wants to know if you could explain a little bit more how a regressive tax can also be redistributive. And he gives an example that actually popped into my mind when you were talking, and that is Social Security, where yes. it's a regressive tax, but the benefits are progressive. So can you talk about that in the, um, in the context of a state and local tax versus federal? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, the, the point is really um, uh, the one that I um, uh, sort of flagged in one of my earlier slides. Uh, the, when we're evaluating whether or not a tax system is progressive or regressive, uh, we're looking at the um, effective tax rate uh, for each uh, chunk of the income distribution. Uh, and um, uh, it, focusing less on the amount of revenue generated. Uh, so uh, even where you have a regressive rate structure, uh, it it's, remains the case that uh, individuals uh, that are subject to the lower rates at higher income levels uh, are paying more in tax than individuals uh, in, in actual absolute amount of tax. Uh, than individuals who are subject to the lower rates, um, or I'm sorry, the, high, the higher rates at lower income levels. And so um, uh, assuming that the revenue that's derived from this regressive tax system is um, uh, spent in a way that uh, promotes um, the, the well-being of um, the you know, bottom half of the income distribution, then the overall effect of the regressive tax and the progressive spending system is uh, to serve the purpose of, of redistribution. Um, now, I think you could say in an ideal world, there should be both a progressive tax system uh, and a progressive um, uh, uh, um, uh, spending system uh, so that we're, we're deriving uh, um, the sort of redistributive benefits uh, from both components of the fiscal system, both the tax side uh, and the spending side. Um, that, and that's something, uh, for example, that, that California has done. Um, uh, but the, I guess what I would be reluctant to do is I would be reluctant um, to um, reduce overall revenues uh, in the service of um, mitigating uh, tax regressivity. Um, so, for example, if you told me uh, that um, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, pick a state that has a, reg a very regressive tax system, and uh, you know, eliminate, um, say, the retail sales tax, um, well, that's going to make the tax system more progressive, uh, but it's also going to make the overall fiscal system less redistributive. Uh, so I think we want to be careful about um, uh, um, the sort of policy implications that flow from the undeniable fact that, that uh, tax systems um, at the state and local level are, are, are often regressive. What's fascinating about uh, those comments is that it's complicated. And unfortunately, uh, politicians often rely on sound bites and things that have salience like rates. So we need to think about federal, uh, the incidence of federal tax, state and local tax, and of course, as you just uh, discussed, spending 
we have to look at all of it together to really think of critically about um, what if we are uh, progressive or regressive or if we're lifting up folks who need to be lifted up. And so it's complicated. Uh, Lisa, I have a question for you. And that is that uh, someone wanted to know, what are the two other main issues that ITEP focuses on besides equity? Yeah, so very relevant to the conversation we're just having. Um, equity in and of itself is, is never the sole focus or the goal of a tax system. There's these other um, interests. So the main values that we really focus and hold up and advocate for include tax systems that are adequate, right? raise enough revenues to, to fund the, the spending for the, the public goods, as well as sustainability, right? So making sure that your tax base is growing, uh, both with the economy and with need and costs. So those sort of three things together um, are sort of the values that we think are the most important to not sort of in a vacuum optimize, but particularly given the context in which uh, what of the other values, competing values, oftentimes tend to be optimized, we, we amplify uh, the value of those other three things. Great, thank you. Uh, yes. One thing that I'd like to ask all of you, and that is, we have lots of folks who are engaged with civil rights and social justice on the call, and thinking about what they can do in their local government and state government. Um, what sort of uh, strategies have worked for state and local governments? What's so wonderful, again, on the ITAP uh, website is to look at all 50 states plus Washington, D.C. and see all the various, they're like laboratories, to see all the very creative things that they're doing to try to um, uh, mitigate regressivity, spend better. So for example, uh, I know many states do have, uh, Professor Stark, um, credits, sales tax credits at the state and local system. Um, but I think that's a great idea to think about it federally and maybe have it be um, uh, fully refundable. California, as a great example, um, has an earned income tax credit that is refundable. And I would imagine that that's why California state income tax system is more progressive or less regressive, as you said. So what other strategies can states and local governments, folks on the ground uh, implement to try to change this? Do you mind if I hop in first? Um, so, uh, there's a lot of different levers that can be worked with, even in states that don't have an income tax. Um, and I, th I don't know that we've ever sort of advocated for um, states enacting tax cuts in order to achieve progressivity, we would always sort of recommend that those be revenue neutral forms or even revenue raising because oftentimes states are under investing in their critical um, priorities. Um, so for states that, that have a more regressive mix, so for example, in Washington state, um, they've been working at, for example, enacting an excise tax on capital gains income. They're constitutionally barred right now from enacting an income tax. So looking at uh, ways in which to introduce more progressivity into their tax system um, by taxing certain kinds of income from wealth, um, as one example. Um, we oftentimes work with states who, um, for example, in order to more adequately invest in their infrastructure, their roads, their bridges, you know, the tax that's earmarked for that is their motor fuel, you know, or both excise taxes and sales taxes, which is an appropriate uh, source for that funding. And we oftentimes work with states while they're raising that revenue to work hand in hand with either enacting a state earned income tax credit or increasing their EITC, or maybe if they have like a sales tax credit, increasing the amount of that to at a minimum hold harmless those individuals that are in the lowest income quintile. So there are lots of strategies that can be used to both sort of with the recognition that 
regressive sales tax bases, for example, are always going to be in the mix, right? They're, they're always going to be a prime and an important source of revenue for states. Um, but there are ways to provide targeted relief um, to, to populations that we are wanting to be to, to mitigate some of the unfairness of the higher effective tax rates that those sales tax have on those individuals. Um, and then other options include, so for states that have an income tax, right, or for states that are even looking to enact sales taxes, look to cut the taxes that are more regressive, right, look to lower your overall sales tax rate rather than cut the income tax rate, which disproportionately will benefit your highest income earners in the state and agitate the regressivity of the overall tax system. Um, and those who are looking to raise revenue, but in more progressive ways, and that have income taxes in place, you know, it's it's movements like in my home state of Illinois, looking to change from a flat income tax rate system to a graduated rate system. It might be something more modest, like limiting certain exemptions or deductions to income. So in Illinois, a couple of years ago, they enacted um, the, a new threshold so that individuals don't actually qualify to receive the personal exemption if they have incomes over $250,000. So there's a ways to target certain tax breaks so that they're only going to individuals who are already paying a disproportionate share of their income in taxes. Um, with, and that also limits the sort of the amount of revenue loss that states are facing in trying to do more targeted relief. So those are a few ideas. Great, thank you. Professor Stark, you want to weigh in or? Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, part of this is my uh, reaction to your question is may maybe a function of the fact that I'm finishing up this uh, seminar on Prop 13 uh, mm. and we've got an initiative that's going to be on the ballot next year to um, very substantially reform uh, certain components of uh, Prop 13 relating to property taxes. Um, I would like to see states um, uh, uh, sort of reinvent and reinvigorate uh, property taxes uh, and uh, rely uh, more on property taxes than we have in the past. We've gone through basically uh, almost a, a half century uh, of very substantially uh, curtailing um, uh, reliance on, on property taxes, but um, I think it's... Uh, you know, by all accounts, um, one of the most effective sources of revenue uh, for state and local government. Um, that uh, uh, comes with a couple of caveats. Um, you know, I think there is a, a role for uh, so-called circuit breakers and um, having uh, mechanisms involved in um, the administration of property taxes that uh, mitigate the uh, um, uh, liquidity effects uh, for individuals who may have uh, um, uh, higher value property but low income. Uh, and so, uh, in effect, what you're doing when you introduce a circuit breaker that uh, limits the amount of property tax liability as a function of, of income is you're sort of melding uh, those two tax bases together, both the property tax uh, and the income tax. And so, it becomes sort of a hybrid tax uh, where your property tax liability is a function uh, not only of the value of your property but um, also the the amount of your income and so I think that um, you know had that device been uh, put to more effective use back in the mid 1970s it might have uh, forestalled the the um, uh, tax revolt that that started here with Howard Jarvis's efforts in um, 1978 uh, the other thing about property taxes like to the extent that it's a local tax um, I think you do need to attend to uh, the fact that there are disparities uh, in property values um, among school districts, among mm -hmm. cities, among counties, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so that puts a lot of pressure on uh, the need to devise um, uh, revenue sharing arrangements among local governments uh, so that you can um, rely on um, uh, lo the sort of local fiscal autonomy associated with using local property taxes, but at the same time um, avoid the uh, um, uh, you know the adverse effects of uh, effectively delegating um, uh, funding responsibility to governments that have different fiscal capacities. Uh, and so that's that I think is a, a, a project um, mm -hmm. that uh, you know has obviously been a very important. 
uh, focal point of uh, school finance reform over the past uh, half century. Um, but it, it's really a, a, a much bigger question as well about how to fund subnational governments when there are disparities across uh, jurisdictional boundaries in the availability of taxable resources. Well, thank you very much. Professor Crawford, I'm going to give you uh, the last word. Uh, what if, if we've got some tax justice passion warriors online who want to try to um, change the pink tax in their own local uh, area or state, what would be the best role model? Definitely reading your law review articles, but beyond that. Um, I, I would say start where you are and use the resources you have. Uh, there are lots of uh, folks in all communities working on these issues. You can start small, you can start big. Um, but until we're able to talk openly about the way tax impacts people differently on the basis of their gender, their race, their income status, we're, we're not going to be able to make progress until we are, are able to talk to each other very well. So for folks who are interested in the pink tax, um, my favorite is the story of a Brooklyn Girl Scout troop who uh, took matters into their own hands and, and tested whether New York City was living up to its promise to provide these products for free. Um, so the, the youngest would-be taxpayers among us um, are, are also interested in these issues. So start wherever you are, do what you can, and keep asking questions about how taxes impact people differently based on uh, identity and income categories. Well, thank you everyone across America for more than five decades, the section ABA tax sec or ABA section of civil rights and social justice economic justice committee has worked on hundreds of issues addressing a broad range of civil rights, civil liberties and international human rights. Today, the section continues to promote policies affecting religious freedom, LGBTQ rights, gender equity, and other significant civil rights issues. Please consider making a deduction or making a donation, which may or may not provide a deduction to our section uh, at donate.americanbar.org backslash CRSJ. Your gift will help make our efforts possible for decades to come. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Francine.